Thank you, Rob, for inviting me uh, to be here, and Alyssa also. I'm very pleased to be in Dodge County. Um, I haven't got a lot of experience in Dodge County, and I understand I'm not the only one who had trouble finding this building <laughs> uh, with my fancy Google Maps or whatever. But anyway, we're all here, and that's great. Um, you are really, really fortunate in Dodge County. You know why? You go well, out to a beautiful place, yes. It's a nice place to live, etc. But you have a dementia care specialist. It's wonderful. Uh, but not every county has a dementia care specialist. So um, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit, uh, in a little bit, about the Fox Valley Memory Project. Um, and we're up in uh, northeast Wisconsin. We're in um, Allegheny County, a little part of Calumet, a little part of Winnebago, and Wapaka. Um, but we don't have any dementia care specialists in those counties. And, and um, there are some areas in Wisconsin that have a dementia care specialist. Uh, there's one up in um, Bayfield and Ashland. And she covers five counties and three tribes. Okay, and you have Rob for Dodge County. So, hooray! It's just, I, I mean, I just can't tell you how great that is. Uh, and so I hope that if you're not familiar with what dementia care specialists do, I hope you'll get to know Rob. <laughs> um, and I also have to ask you, oh, you you've got this great t-shirt on. So, um, <laughs> show the t-shirt. Hey, I'm going to be Feel free to um, 
uh, ask a question or make a comment. So here is my wordy slide. It's an outline. Remember, I'm a teacher, so you know, we do this. Uh, uh, so there. Oops. Be good to turn the thing on. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. So um, here's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, we're going to start by talking about some numbers. This is not going to come as any surprise to any of you, but I'm going to drill down to Dodge County, <coughs> so that might have some interest for you. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about social attitudes. Um, we're here to really kind of get fired up about dementia-friendly communities. Uh, maybe so we could all wear these t-shirts. Um, uh, we're here to get uh, inspired to uh, assist Rob in developing memory cafes all around Dodge County. And if you don't live in Dodge County, wherever you live, okay? But what I want to do this morning is to kind of give you the rationale for why we're doing this, okay? Why should we do this? Well, maybe we should do this because of these negative social attitudes. Okay, and how can we fix that? And how can we make life better for people living with dementia? Right? How can we make life better? And when I talk about people living with a dementia, I mean the person who has the diagnosis, the person who has never gotten an official diagnosis but knows there's something wrong, and the person who we call up in the, the Fox Valley, the care partner. Do you use that language in Dodge County, the care partner? Um, so we talk about family care partners who are the husbands, the wives, the adult children, the grandchildren sometimes. I had a student one time who lived in a four generation house. She was the youngest. Her mother was taking care of her own mother, the student's grandmother, and the student's great-grandmother. The grandmother and the great-grandmother both had a form of dementia. And so, you know, that was, they were care partners, right? And, and uh, we talk about paid caregivers. So just to kind of keep the language straight, caregivers, like with home health care agencies who come into your house. Oh, well, you've got a t-shirt too. <laughs> Any other t-shirts in the room? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so we talk about paid caregivers. They work in long-term care, assisted living, home care, etc. But then the care partners are the ones uh, uh, caring uh, who are not paid. Okay. <laughs> right? All right. So uh, now there's something else I want to um, uh, note to you about my wordy outline. Oh, <laughs> my wordy outline um, is that notice that I've got here social attitudes about the dimensions. See, I didn't know that I was going to volunteer to do this session. I don't even know what time it's supposed to be, but I am really committed to talking about the dimensions because most of the time, all we ever hear about is Alzheimer's disease, right? And the reason why we hear about Alzheimer's disease, well, that, I think there's two big reasons. One is because most dementias are in that category of Alzheimer's disease. Right now, that's what we think. About 70% of all people who have a form of dementia have some kind of Alzheimer's disease. So that's one reason, because, you know, there's more of them. And the second reason, that people just think about Alzheimer's disease is because of the wonderful work of the Alzheimer's Association, right? So you hear about the Alzheimer's Association, but do you ever hear about, you know, the frontotemporal organization? <coughs> no, you don't. Uh, so we usually focus in on Alzheimer's disease, but there are many types of dementia. And we don't want to leave anybody out. We're here to talk about inclusion, right? We want to include folks who have a dementia in our communities. And we don't want to exclude you if you feel like, well, I don't have Alzheimer's disease, so maybe you don't want me. Okay, we do, all right? So the dementias. Does that make sense? 
okay? Um, all right, so then we're gonna talk about social attitudes, what is stigma, how does it feel, etc. And then we're gonna say, okay, now we've seen that there are a lot of these negative attitudes out there. What are we gonna do about it? What are we going to do about it? How are we going to make it possible for people to live as well as they can with a dementia? How are we going to make it possible when there's all this kind of negative energy out there around this topic? All right. Everybody understand what we're trying to do here today? We're trying to do something revolutionary, folks. You're part of a revolution. We are trying to change the culture around the dementias. So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to bring it down to Wisconsin. And I'm going to talk to you about all the exciting things. Well, not all the exciting things, but some of the exciting things that are happening in Wisconsin. Uh, things that you can access, information that you can get to, uh, to help you encourage your communities to be dementia friendly. Then we're going to talk about problems that we face, not just as folks who are living with a dementia, but as aging individuals in general. And then we're going to give you some examples of community inclusion. And that's where I'll talk more about memory cafes and Spark and what we do up in the Fox Valley. So everybody ready here? Last wordy slide. Okay. All right. Here we go. Dementia demographic. Is that, is that, it looks, it looks a little blurry to me. Is it, does it look blurry to you? Is it just my eyes or? It's a little blurry. Does anybody know how to focus this? You know, I could have some film on my glasses. <laughs> We're all getting old. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. I just turned 70. Yay. numbers that, of, you know, in a population, whatever it is that we're measuring. So here's one of my favorite slides. Some of you have probably seen this slide. It comes from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. Um, and this is worth spending a little time with. So this is a comparison of what happens to our state in 20 years, between 2015 and 2035. <coughs> Okay, so you need to know what these colors stand for. The lightest color is that there is uh, over here in St. Croix County, 11 to 12% uh, of the population is 65 and older. Okay? St. Croix County, what's so special about St. Croix County, folks? Anybody know? Small population, sir. Yeah. Do you ever take Route 94 over to the Twin Cities? Did you go through Hudson? Okay. So, and you cross the St. Croix River? Well, there's a lot of folks, young families, who have moved to that county because then they commute to the Twin City. The housing prices are lower. Okay. So that is a county that is was younger in 2015, and it stays younger in 2035, although this dark green up here is getting up to 20% is 65 and older. 25%. But look what happens so quickly to most of our state. All right. Now up here in Bayfield, Iron, and Vilas counties, uh, we've already, and uh, Burnett, we've already got the dark blue up here. There's a price. And that means that there is it could be as many as 40%, maybe 43% of the people are 65 and older. But in 20 years, look what happens. Well, we're mostly the state. Right? So let's find Dodge County right here. Very dark. <laughs> Got it? See that? Dodge County, Marquette, Washington. 
that. Door County, no surprise there. A lot of people go there to retire, right? But up to 43.4% of your county is going to be 65 and older in the year 2035. That's not that far away, right? I can remember teaching in the 1970s, and I would have my students, so I'd be standing in front of a college classroom, and I'd say, you know, it'd be like 1974, and I'd say, okay, now I want you all to figure out how old are you going to be in the year 2000, right? And then, oh my gosh, I'm 40. <laughs> and, and the year 2000 might like, seem impossible, right? Would, would that ever happen? Y2K, remember that? Yeah. Uh, so, so here now we are in the year 2018, and 2035 isn't that far, and our state is rapidly aging. And the only ones that stay green are St. Croix, Dane County, that's not a surprise because they've got a rather large university there, okay? Uh, we've got Milwaukee down here and Kenosha. Kenosha is another spot where people move with young families uh, for housing prices and then they commute to Chicago, right? But the rest of the state is blue. Is this taking into effect just current population or is there a birth rate in there? Well, there's a birth rate up here in Clark County. So it's, it's taking into account how many babies they think are going to be that, Well, uh, it's mostly taking into account aging, current aging, yes. Current aging, yes. Do you have a source for that? I'm just really yes, sure. this is the Department of Health Services, um, Wisconsin Department of DHS. Census, census, census. Yeah, yeah, based on census data, yes. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it is, I just, I think this is so fascinating. And when you think about it, I mean, even think about, think about, you know, St. Croix County and Dave and Kenosha and Milwaukee, 20%, 65 and over. That means that everywhere you go in those counties, one out of every five people, one out of every five, at the shopping mall, at church, maybe it's a little more at church, uh, 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 you know, at a sporting event, at a rock and roll concert, one out of every five is 65 and older. Okay? It's amazing. Okay. Well, I'm crazy about maps. Um, it's a good thing I studied those maps last night to figure out how to get here today. Uh, but um, let's move on from the maps. Okay. So, keeping in mind those uh, demographics, the most well-documented risk factor for Alzheimer's and other dementias is age. Okay, that is why we are here this morning, folks. All right, do you want to go back to that one? All right, the most well-documented risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias is age. And here we are. So, how about Dutch County? You asked about the census data. So what I did was to look up on um, the web. You can get all kinds of census data. And I looked up Dodge County. And I um, uh, went through and, cal whoops, sorry, and calculated uh, how many people you have in the county who are full between 40 and 64, 65, 74, 75, 84, and 85. Now the reason why I use those ages is because I was interested in these percentages that come from a very good study that was published in 2013 that was looking at prevalence rates for the dementias, okay? So, you know, it's, it's hard to estimate this because a lot of people never get an official diagnosis. But as best we know, about 4% of people between ages 40 and 64 have a form of dementia, about 4%. And so what I did was multiply the number of people you have in Dodge County between in those age, uh, in that age range by 4%. And you have about 1,200 people who may have a diagnosable form of dementia who are between ages 40 and 64. And look what happens with the other ages. So these percentages, again, come from this uh, study published in 2013. 
the total, you could have over 5,000 people just in this county. You think Rob's got a lot of work cut out for him? Yeah. You think you folks in the t-shirts have a lot of work cut out for you? Yeah. Okay. Right now, this is not 2035. This is using 2010 census data. And um, uh, this uh, national study, which is a good, you know, I've looked at a bunch of these studies, and this one's good. So there you are. So what are we going to do about it? What are the attitudes about all these people who have a form of dementia? Well, now I have to, I have to get a little academic for you. So you have to forgive me, you know. It's, of the thing with me. Uh, I want to talk to you about stigma. You know that word stigma, but you may not know that it goes back to a really famous book <coughs> that was published in 1963. This guy, Irvin Goffman, was a sociologist. And, and so he was the one who really kind of made us think about stigma. What does that mean? And I've always loved the part of the title of the book that comes after the colon. Notes on the Management of Spoiled Identity. Just think about that for a minute. Spoiled Identity. You get stigmatized. I have a very dear friend who was in a car accident over 40 years ago and has been paraplegic ever since. Right? He's been in a wheelchair. And, and he was a strong, athletic guy, a teacher, uh, and now he's a guy in a wheelchair, all right? His identity was spoiled in a way, right? Because he's not the person that he thought he was before the accident. What happens when you get that diagnosis of dementia, some form of dementia? Do people start to see you differently? Is your identity spoiled in a way? What we're trying to do here with dementia-friendly communities is to stop that from happening, right? We want to we want to banish the stigma. We want stigma-free zones. That's what a memory cap day is. But there's still a lot of stigma out there. Right? Now. Now I want to give you some bullet points. This is another kind of wordy slide, sorry about that. Um, about, about what goes into making stigma. This comes from a study that was done in the 21st century, so uh, longer after this book was published. So there's four points here, and they build on each other, and I want you to kind of get this story. The first point is that it happens when People distinguish and label human differences. Well, hello. Okay. I have gray hair. Okay? So I am different from those of you in the audience who do not yet have gray hair. And there is a certain stigma attached to gray hair, women in particular, right? The men you can kind of get a very distinguished looking. All right? But you know, we're old. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, you know, so we all notice human differences, right? We notice young, old, we notice man, woman, we notice, you know, black, white, we notice um, disabled, able-bodied, we, we notice differences. And there's nothing wrong with that, it's just part of who we are. But, remember I said there were four points here, so we notice differences, and then there are cultural beliefs that link certain labeled persons to undesirable characteristics. So I'll use myself and give as an example. Okay. Gray hair, old woman, right here. Okay. Undesirable characteristics. Slower, maybe can't do tech. Okay. No, that's probably accurate. Uh, 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 out of it, you know, not not like in with the in crowd, right? Undesirable characteristics for older adults, right? There's, you ever hear ageism, okay? Yeah, there's a lot of that around there. Okay, so there are cultural beliefs that link these labels to undesirable characteristics. The label, I can't, 
understands this label. This makes me crazy when people talk about dementia patients. Right? You hear that all the time. It's in the news, it's in magazines, it's on newspapers, and you know, dementia patients. You are only a patient when you're sitting in the doctor's office or in a hospital or some other kind of healthcare environment. You are not a patient when you're walking around on the street. You're not a patient when you're going to the, you know, gas station, the drugstore, your church. You're, you're not, you're a person, right? I have arthritis. I've had arthritis practically my whole life. Do I want to be called an arthritis patient? No, right? Okay, but you see what we do. We, we give these labels. I'll talk more about this in a minute, and it makes it very narrow, this category. Okay, so we link these people with these labels to undesirable characteristics, and then we separate us and them. Okay, we're the young, hip ones, right? Okay, you're the gray-haired old ones. Okay, us, them, right? We separate. And you can think about that in all different categories in our culture. Person with a dementia. Person who's aging successfully. Okay. If we talk about, and this is something gerontologists talk about, aging successfully. So what does that mean? If you have a dementia, does that mean you failed at aging? Yeah, that's kind of the attitude. Right? Right? So the last point here. So we separate, we attach these undesirable characteristics, us and them, and then labeled people are discriminated against. They experience status loss, lead to unequal outcomes. Okay? So you're a lawyer. You've been a lawyer your whole life. You've been successful as a lawyer. And then you got that diagnosis. That diagnosis, and, and you've tried not to tell anybody, but some people have noticed, and, and the word had gotten out. You have a dementia, all right? And do people change their views of you? Probably. Okay. Do you experience status loss? Probably. Now you're a dementia patient, according to a lot of people, right? And discrimination. Okay, how does that happen? You're a lawyer who happens to have a form of dementia and you're out at a restaurant, uh, say you're a man and you're out at a restaurant with your wife, who's your care partner, and um, the uh, wait staff in the restaurant comes up and says to your wife, what will he have? Um, right? Okay? Like, like you can't speak? Right? Happens all the time. All the time. So, stigma. In the doctor's office, too. Oh, in the doctor's office. They'll talk yes. to the child. The yes, doctor. absolutely. Yes. Um, how's your mother feeling today? <laughs> it's right there. Why don't you ask her? Okay? Yeah. All right. Dementia has been called a disease of exclusion. A disease of exclusion. Uh, I'm going to give you some examples of that in a minute, but I want you to think about that. The disease of exclusion. That is what we are trying to change. We are trying to create communities that include people with a dementia, that don't exclude them, right? We want to have people feel included and supported. How does it feel to be excluded? There's a lot of research on this now. It's really interesting. You know, you know the term cold shoulder? You get cold shoulder. Okay. Well, people actually respond differently. I mean, physiologically, they've done studies of this, of what happens to your body when you are given the cold shoulder. Okay. When you are excluded. How does it feel? It feels really bad. I brought some quotes to read to you. Take them out here. Hold on a sec. Okay. This first quote comes from a, a wonderful uh, 
uh, man uh, named Richard Taylor. He died a couple of years ago. He was a clinical psychologist who got the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And he wrote a, just a marvelously insightful book about what it was like. Um, it was called Alzheimer's from the Inside Out. And it's just Richard Taylor, I just loved him. I had the opportunity to hear him talk one time. And he was quite an advocate for eliminating the stigma. Listen to what he had to say about his own experience of being excluded and how it felt. I have become keenly aware of a patterned response from some individuals as soon as they find out I have Alzheimer's disease. They switch their eye contact and attention to whomever I am with. It is as if knowledge of the disease immediately cloaks me in invisibility. Richard has left the room. My body may still be here, but no one who can understand what I am is at home. This happens with doctors, okay, suit salespeople, haircutters, produce managers, appliance repair persons, and many others. Okay? All of a sudden, Richard becomes invisible. Let me read you a couple other quotes. These quotes now come from um, a study that was done in Great Britain, which has really given us so much insight into being dementia friendly. And they taught me a lot about many cafes a uh, uh, number of years ago. So here's some quotes from some British people. Um, Friends, family are uncomfortable and say they don't know how to behave normally around me anymore. They didn't really <coughs> give our relationship a chance to move forward. That's somebody who has a dementia talking about, he, he notices people are uncomfortable around me. Here's another one, <coughs> really interesting. It's very interesting to see how people close to me act. It's almost as if they're afraid of bringing up the subject. Being a cancer survivor, I know that I was constantly asked how I was doing while I was going through treatment with Alzheimer's. No one asks. Okay. I uh, wrote a book a couple of years ago um, called Aging Together, because we're all aging together. And in it, I um, uh, told the story of a woman who talked about her husband who had Alzheimer's disease. And uh, they had been very active members of a, of a church. And, um, but she noticed that as soon as the word got out that her husband had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, people just started kind of drifting away. Right? Well, it's contagious, right? Yeah, like, it, oh, oh, yeah, right, it's an epidemic. So we need to, we need to, you know, quarantine you. Anyway, people started drifting away. But then she said, okay, so he's had Alzheimer's disease, this diagnosis for a few years, but then he got cancer. And all of a sudden, people showed up with casseroles. <laughs> all right, here's my last quote. This, again, comes from a person living with a dementia. Treat us like normal people. We're still here, just a little slower and sometimes confused. Right. Treat us like normal people. We're a little slower. Sometimes we're confused, but you know, sometimes all of us are confused. All right, so now I have a story to tell you. Yes? I just wanted to share, many years ago, I was working with a gentleman with Alzheimer's, and it just sticks in my mind, I can't recall the exact quote, but he basically told me, he says, I'm living in a fishbowl. Uh, I see everything going on around me, I reach out to be a part of it, and I can't. Uh, again, did you hear her say, see, she worked with somebody who said, it's like living with, in a fishbowl, I reach out, to try to touch, and I can't. Yeah. Right, that's, that's a good description, thank you. Okay, so here's a story. Um, and this story comes from um, uh, the son of a friend of my husband's and mine. Um, and this son was uh, doing some volunteer work at a continuum of care retirement community that we have up in Appleton. And uh, so it's one of these places that has independent living and 
you know, assisted living and memory care and skilled care. And they even have hospice up there. Uh, so anyway, this is a high school student who is volunteering there. And he's volunteering to help people get to the dining room. He comes home after the first week of volunteering there, and he says to his father, Dad, this is awful, what I am observing here. He said, it's like junior high without the <laughs> algebra. And do you know why? Because there's a cool kids table. And the cool kids are the ones who don't have walkers, who don't have a, some kind of dementia diagnosis, and they do not want to associate with anybody else. Some of the worst ageism is among the old. Right? And you find this. You find bullying in long-term care. Some of you may have experienced this. Right? So it's like junior high without the algebra. So you see the stigma? We separate, we label us them. Okay? We're the, we're the cool kids. Yeah, I don't want to deal with you because it might catch you. And you know it's not, but yeah. All right. Stigma. So why do we stigmatize it so much? Why do we add all these images? Well, here's one possible reason. It's because of the association of dementia with other stuff that scares us, like death. All right, no, nobody wants to really talk about death, right? Okay. But we know that the dementias eventually are terminal. Well, have, you know what? Life is terminal. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to talk about it. And then there's this other thing that we associate with dementia, and that's dependency. I might have to depend on somebody else, or God forbid I should have to wear something called depends. Right? I don't want to have to rely on anybody else. I'm a self-made person. I can stand on my own two feet, blah, blah, blah. None of us is completely independent. We all rely on other people in some way or other, right? But the, the image out there in our society is we must be independent as long as possible. I am 98 years old and I'm a little slow and I am a little bit confused, but I'm going to drive that car. <laughs> right? Because I want to hold on to my independence, even if it means killing somebody. Right? I want to hold on to my independence. So we are terrified of dependency, even though we all depend on each other for various things. We're terrified of death, and dementia gets mixed in with that. Fear in our hypercognitive culture, right? Who has the best computer? Who has the biggest hard drive? Who has the most memory? who has the fastest computer, right? This is all stuff we, we honor, correct? You've got one of those clunky old computers, right? Slow, you have a slow one, you, you still use a modem? You know, whatever. Um, uh, so in our culture today, uh, it's been described as hypercognitive. We value the people who can, you know, keep a lot of information in their heads, who can rattle off a lot of stuff, right? Uh, uh, we are uh, uh, people who um, honor the ones who have the good cognitive skills. And if you don't, look how many older adults will say, and they, they, they don't have a diagnosis of dementia, but they'll say, ah, it's a senior moment. Or my mom, who had um, of dementia, my mom used to talk about having Parkinson's disease. Oh, you heard that okay. one? Okay. All right. Um, you know, and and so, yeah, we value what the, you know is up here, the smart kids, right? The kids who get the C's in school. Well, not so much, right? Not that. 
kids who are in the honor society. They're the ones that really count. All right, so fear. So where does this fear come from? Well, it comes from all around us. It comes when we talk about epidemics. These epidemics are pretty darn scary, but it's not a good word to apply to the dementias <laughs> because it's not contagious. And we shouldn't be quarantining people. We should be including them in our communities. Um, but here's an example of the language of fear. So this is a publication that came out a few years ago. And um, it is zeroing in on fear. It is called Generation Alzheimer's, the Defining Disease of the Baby Boomers. Oh, that'll get you, right? <laughs> right? Woohoo! The Defining Disease of the Baby Boomers. So here's what I did. I went through this publication and I pulled out some quotes. These are exact quotes from this publication. The defining disease of the baby boom generation. Well, hello, yes, it could be up, but very well be. Right? You remember those maps? <laughs> those are a lot of baby boomers in those uh, dark blue areas, right? In 2035? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, so greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's and other dementias is age. Yeah, it could be the defining disease. I don't deny that. And I don't deny this next quote either. Definitely can be devastating, deteriorating, debilitating, and heartbreaking. Absolutely. I am not here to whitewash anything. Right? I do not have rose colored glasses. I know how much suffering there is, I know how much loss there is. But I also know that when the community comes together, it is possible to live as well as you can with this condition. Right? Yes, it's devastating, deteriorating, debilitating, and heartbreaking, yes. But it can be some other things too. Here's some more quotes from that publication, Generation Alzheimer's. It means the loss of anything and everything you have ever known. everything. When that grandchild crawls up on your lap and you get to snuggle, okay? It's one of the best moments, right? To have a child on your lap. You haven't lost anything, right? It doesn't mean the loss of anything and everything you have ever known. You know, you, you can put that favorite music on. Some of you know about the music and memory program, right? You can put that favorite music on, and it just transports you, right? I mean, you didn't lose that. You still can enjoy that music, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Here's another quote from that publication. Remember, we're talking about fear language. It takes everything away from does it take the love of your family away from you? Well, in some families, yes. But not always. In fact, most of the time, most families hang in there with their loved ones. Most families do that. American families do not abandon their elders, despite what you hear, okay? American families do not put their own people in nursing homes. Sometimes, when they can no longer manage um, the daily life for their loved ones, some form of long-term care is necessary. And, by the way, very often the person who moves into this long-term care uh, uh, residence does better. They get three meals a day, they get their meds on time, they're with other people, all right? They're not in a, quote, nursing home for one. So it doesn't take everything away from you. And then this is the last quote that I pulled from this. This one's really hard. Alzheimer's robs people of all bodily functions and eventually their humanity. Now, if you believe that, if you believe that Alzheimer's and other dementias rob you of everything, including your humanity, then 
why on earth are we here today? <laughs> why are you folks in the t-shirts trying so hard to educate your community about how to be dementia friendly if we think people have lost their humanity? Right? Isn't that a rather dangerous statement? If you think about it in terms of how we should care for people? I think it's kind of dangerous. That's, that's a that's a statement that is meant to evoke fear. And that's not good for any of us. So who's affected by this fear? Well, certainly the people who have the memory loss, they're affected. They don't want to obtain an early diagnosis. They know something's not right, but they don't want to tell anybody. And sometimes they might tell their primary care doctor, but the primary care doctor says something like, I oh, thought we all forget things. Right? I forget things. Everybody, you're, you're fine. A lot of primary, primary care doctors don't want to face up to this. So you don't want to get a diagnosis. So if you don't get a diagnosis, you don't get any of the medications that may slow down the progression to a certain point. And you're not able to plan things. You're not able to take that trip that you've been putting off for such a long time. You're not, you know, right? You need, you need to know some things with the diagnosis, but you don't want it because you're afraid. And also, then you start to withdraw from social contacts because you are afraid you might say the wrong thing. You might embarrass yourself or your loved one. And so, well, I just don't want to go out today. I don't want to go to that memory cafe. But we want you at the memory cafe. If we could just get you to one memory cafe, you know, you'd find out how wonderful it is. But, um, but no, I, don't, I just don't want to be around people anymore. My mom had that problem. She couldn't follow conversations. Okay. She, you know, or several people would be talking, and then she, I'd see her just kind of fading back, okay, because she, she withdrew. So, who's affected by the fear? The people with the memory loss, but then of course the family members and friends because they become <coughs> isolated also. I interviewed uh, people living with uh, dementia uh, all over northeast Wisconsin a couple of years ago about, about their friends. I was interested in friendship. And uh, one woman, uh, she was living out on a farm uh, over by uh, Sheboygan, Manitowoc. And uh, she was taking care of her dad, and she was taking care of the farm, and she was taking care of the kids, and all the things that go together. And she said, our friends don't come around as much anymore. Okay? So she was becoming more isolated because she was caring for her father. And people didn't know what to say to him. They didn't know how to act around him. So she's experiencing the isolation. And then there's the rest of us who work with folks who have a, a dementia, OK? And, and the, the uh, academic term is status contamination. It goes something like this. You, uh, you're sitting on an airplane, and you're talking to people, and you say, like I'll say, well, I work with people who have a dementia. And people say, isn't that depressing? Right? Or they'll say, wouldn't you rather work with children? <laughs> OK, because this is, this is scary, right? This is scary to people. And so all of us are affected by this. Every single one of us is affected by this. So what are we going to do about it? Well, some of us might want to do that. <laughs> but it's not a good idea. We can tell a new story. And that's what I'm here to do today, is to tell a new story about living with a dementia, some form of dementia. We can tell a new story, not the old story. It's all doom and gloom. It's all fear. Okay. We can tell a new story about what happens when communities step forward and say, we're going to provide some resources and some help and some education. We're going to help you get over the fear. We're going to help you eliminate the stigma.
stigma. All right, that's what we can do with our new story. We can tell a new story about living with a Indonesia. We can change the culture about how we live with a Indonesia by telling this new story. So I want to give you a little history lesson, and then after my history lesson, I'm going to invite you to just stand up and move around, because I'm the only one who can stand up and move around. Oh, there's a few people standing in the back. This is a little history lesson. It's going to be very short. Back in the 19th century, senility, right? Your grandparents might have talked about somebody being senile. We know in the 19th century, not that many people lived so long. The average life expectancy in the United States in 1900 was 47. Okay? So if you got to be 65, 70, and, and you were experiencing memory loss, confusion, the typical things that might come with a dementia, okay, uh, you were senile. That was just it. You know, if you got old, you got seen. Now that was kind of an equivalent term then. But then I've got an interesting date up here, kind of a little strange date, 1906. Um, and the reason why I have 1906 up there is because that is the year that a woman died who had been studied by Dr. Alzheimer. And she she was um, oh, yeah, she had young onset Alzheimer's. So she had started to show symptoms in her early 50s, okay? Auguste D. was her name. And um, Dr. Alzheimer was uh, treating her, and he was noticing her loss of language, her confusion, her difficulties mem uh, remembering things. Um, I used to talk about my mom, and, and I used to describe, you know, her memory's just not sticky anymore, right? It doesn't, things don't stick. Um, and so Dr. Alzheimer had observed all this, and Auguste D. died, and he autopsied her brain, and lo and behold, he found in her brain these characteristic changes that we still talk about today in the brain, plaques and tangles, <coughs> plaques and tangles, okay? So that was 1906. And that ushered in the era in the 20th century in which we pretty narrowly defined the dimensions in terms of the biomedical. This is what is happening to your diseased brain. Right? And that's what we focused on, dementia patients. Remember that I talked about that? Okay. So it was, this, it was this idea of, well, you've got this disease, and we don't know what to do about it, and we'll autopsy your brain after you die. Uh, okay, so then I've got another kind of odd date up here. It's 1997, and this is the year that a little skinny book came out in England, okay, called, by Thomas Kitwood called Dementia Reconsidered, and it was a book that introduced us to the idea of personhood and culture change. Kitwood said, look, We've got to stop narrowly defining people in terms of a disease. We have to hold on to the fact that these are persons. They have a history, right? They, they, they had careers, they had families. They might still have careers and families, right? They are full persons. They have lived in their communities. They have contributed to their communities. They are persons with needs and desires like anybody else. Don't just see them as people with a diseased brain. Okay? They're full persons. And we need to change the culture so that we can accept the fact that they are full persons. Personhood and culture change. It started happening at the end of the 20th century. And then in the 21st century, not so long ago, in about the year 2012, uh, documents came out from the World Health Organization and Alzheimer's Disease International that introduced us to the idea of dementia-friendly communities. Right? Dementia-friendly communities. All right. Instead of saying, "Well, you have you have this disease, and we need to shut you away," okay, 
you're a part of our community. And then more recently, there's been this uh, discussion about social citizenship. Yep. And that means that you are still a part of our community. We want to know what you think. We're going we're gonna, to, we're, we think we ought to design some kind of a program to make this a dementia friendly community. And we want you on the committee. Remember I talked about those baby boomers before? Um, I think there are a few baby boomers in this room who were born between 1946 and 1964. Okay? So, uh, we're kind of a noisy generation. <laughs> I'm just saying. And people in this cohort, this generation, who are getting the diagnosis <coughs> of a dementia, are not going quietly. <laughs> They're writing blogs. They're all over the web. They're wonderful descriptions of what it's like and how it feels to be excluded. They um, are advocating for themselves. They're going to politicians' offices and saying, look, we need to start paying. We need more dementia care specialists, right? Um, uh, they are they're saying, I have Alzheimer's disease. Deal with it. Okay? There's even t-shirts that say this. Alright? So that's what social citizenship means. It means that you are still a part of our community. You're still a citizen. Alright. So we decided that some jewelry of hers had been stolen. Okay? Called me I don't know how many times every day. Where's that jewelry? I want you to find it. Okay? You need to it. I'm sure somebody took it. And then several months later, I was at her apartment, and there are the earrings and things she had been talking about. And I said, Mom, here they are. And, and, and I thought you lost my deal, you so. Okay. So what do you do about that? What do you do about that fear that gets evoked in you by the person you're caring for? Well, first of all, it's nice to be able to talk to other people about it and to realize <coughs> Excuse me, you're not alone with this. That's one of the things that happens in our memory cafes is that care partners get to know each other. You know, when we care for folks with dementia in our communities, we're caring for care partners too. We're all living with dementia. And we may not have a diagnosis, but we're all living with it. And so, um, Finding friends who share that story. Uh, uh, sometimes it helps to laugh. <laughs> like, Mom, you know, nobody stole your jewelry. Didn't do anything for me to tell her that. She was so anxious about it. And of course, when we're older, whether we have a dementia or not, when we're older and we get upset about things, it takes a longer time to get over it. All right? So, um, one of my mother's uh, famous uh, statements is uh, from the time I was a child, where she'd talk about, I just can't get over that. I can't get over that. Well, literally, you can't get over it because your body keeps you revved up. Okay? It's hard. So find some support. Find some support. We're here for you. Rob's here for you. All right. Wisconsin's here for you. Let me give you some examples of what's happening in Wisconsin. I'm going to show you three um, PDFs that have just been published by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. The first one, dementia-friendly libraries. I bet you've got a few libraries in Dodge County. All right? Yay! Library! Oh, right. I love libraries. They're my happy place. Okay. So uh, this is the best practice guide for libraries. Lots of memory cafes are happening in libraries these days. So check it out. Um, I'm giving you the same um, URL for all of these. So you just go to that URL and you, and you tell them which one you want. Okay? So, dementia-friendly libraries in Wisconsin. Memory cafes. Okay? This is what I mostly wrote. Um, it's a how-to. Okay? You want to know how to start a memory cafe? Point one, point two, point three. Here's some challenges of memory cafes. Here's some things to avoid. Um, here's, some, here's some things, here's some ways to market your memory cafe. It's all here in this guide. Okay, it's about 14 pages long. Right. 
So, so that is very helpful because people from all over the state uh, then uh, supplied information to this. And then the mo most recently uh, published one just came out is about dementia coalitions in Wisconsin, best practice guide. So this is about how do you get all these organizations to talk with each other and work with each other, okay? How do you work with the governmental ADRC and your local congregations, okay, and your public library, right? How do you get all these folks to collaborate with one another? And this is another how-to, right? We do not need to build dementia silos. <coughs> Right? We need to work together. That's what that one's about. And then this last one um, is not one of these guys, but this is a program that is coming to Wisconsin. You all, with the t shirts, probably know about this, is the Dementia Friends Program. And so um, last year in 2017, over in Minnesota, you know, our kind of sister state over there, um, they trained 10,000 Minnesotans to be dementia friends. It's an hour-long training on how just how do you reach out to other people, and provide care and hospitality, and, and and how do you just not be afraid and you know you want to take your friend for a walk? Do it. Be a friend. And this program is now coming to Wisconsin, so look for it. Uh, Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute is leading the way. So lots of good things happening in Wisconsin. But what are our problems? What are the biggest problems? What are the things that we need to solve? These are problems that are not just experienced by folks who have a dementia. But they're for many older people. Loneliness, boredom, and helplessness. These are problems for a lot of older people, including people who have a dementia. This comes from an organization called the Eden Alternative. Have you all noticed how when you go to visit somebody in long-term care, uh, there might be a dog running around? And there's plants? And there's little kids who come in to do craft projects? That's because of this organization called the Eden Alternative that said, let's stop making these places like these sterile hospitals. Okay? Let's have birds and fish and cats and dogs and children. And, okay? Um, and so this um, publication by the Eden Alternative comes out and says, these are the three biggest problems, big problems in long-term care and problems for people living at home, too. So what are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about the loneliness? Well, we're going to create community connections. Okay? We're, going to, we're going to provide ways for people to relate to one another in a meaningful way. And what are we going to do about the border? Well, we're going to come, have meaningful activities. We're going to invite folks who have a dementia to volunteer for our organization, doing something that is uh, something that they can do, that they want to do, or we can involve them in arts <coughs> projects, or um, up in the Fox Valley, I'll show you a slide in a minute, we have a chorus, uh, and we perform, and we have cool t-shirts, okay? Uh, uh, we can have some kind of meaningful activity, and what do we do about the helplessness? What we do about the helplessness is we emphasize what people can do instead of what they can't do. What can you do? Many, many years ago, back in the early 70s, I volunteered at the first adult day center in New Jersey. I lived in New Jersey at the time. This is, nobody had ever heard of adult day centers. And this is an adult day center. And we didn't even really talk about dementia or Alzheimer's disease back then. Um, uh, but I'll never forget um, working with a gentleman and what he could do was set the table for lunch. Okay? So I'd stand there with the napkins and I'd hand him a napkin and he'd put it down and then I'd hand him a fork and, and he could set the table. It was quite wonderful. Okay? Alright? That, that gave him a sense of, well, I can do this. I can help other people. I 
can do this. Living well with the dementia, yeah, there are pharmacological treatments, but do the pills help your loneliness? Do the pills help your boredom? Do the pills help your helplessness? No. Okay. Right. They raise your levels of acetylcholine, you know, whatever. Try to attack the animal. Um, the pharmacological treatments are fine, but they're not going to help the loneliness, boredom, and helplessness. So what is going to help? Community engagement. That's why we're here. Activism. Those noisy baby boomers saying, you know, let's, uh, let's pay attention here. Support groups like I was just talking about. Exercise opportunities. You know, let's get some walking groups going for folks who have dementia. Creative outlets and arts involvement. That's the SPARK program in Wisconsin that I'll talk about in a minute. Enjoyment of the natural world. I'm going to tell you a little bit about memory care. And then social connections. All of these involve social connections. And I'm going to talk about memory cafes. Okay? So this is what is going to help us combat the loneliness, the boredom, and the helplessness. All right? Doesn't mean you should stop taking the pills, but they're not going to help the loneliness, boredom, and helplessness. Okay. So, we're going to create dementia-friendly communities. We're going to go from excluding to including people. We're, we're, our community isn't going to fear and stigmatize the dementias. And our institutions are going to extend hospitality and inclusion. And that's what these folks in the t-shirts are training others to do, right? Is to, how do you extend hospitality and inclusion to other people? We're going to create these dementia-friendly communities. And we're going to do it in these ways. This comes from England again. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to include people with dementia in their care partners. That's number one. You ever hear this, nothing about us without us? It comes from the disabilities rights movement. It says, please do not plan programs for us without asking us if, if you want this. OK? All right, don't do stuff for us. Include us. Allow us to participate. Dementia is a disability. We need to start talking about it as a disability. But it's not, it's not ramps and you know, automatic doors that are going to help us accommodate this disability. It's going to be accommodated with patience and practice. Right? It's a disability. And we can accommodate it. So we're going to challenge stigma and build understanding. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to educate all people of all ages. There's a curriculum in Wisconsin now for teaching about dementia. One hour, unfortunately, just one hour, in health classes. All right, let's teach our kids about dementia. I spent a, a whole day at Appleton North High School in September teaching all these classes, one after another. Um, about dementia. Um, let me tell you that ninth grade boys are still kind of oochie, but uh, uh, it's okay. I had a great time, and they were very interested, these kids. Very interested. Right? We're going to educate all ages, and we're going to give people opportunities to develop what I call personhood based knowledge. That is, get to know me as a person. Volunteer at a memory cafe. Volunteer at a library program. Volunteer at your church that's doing some kind of respite care. Right? Get to know these people as persons. And you'll find out how much joy there can be. So that's how you challenge students. You provide accessibility because after all, you know, there's folks with dementia who can't hear very well, they can't see very well, they have mobility problems, so you make sure that everything's accessible. You acknowledge their potential. You encourage and support early diagnosis. That one's tricky. No doctor wants to be a geriatric psychiatrist, right? Because who do you get paid by? Medicare. All right? So what's the best way to make a lot of money if you want to work with older adults? 
like, uh, oh, let's fix the baby boomers' knees. <laughs> All right? That's how we can make money. But uh, diagnosing dementia, not so much. And we need more people doing this. So we need to encourage and support early diagnosis and give practical support to engage in the life of the community. What else? We need to define living well with dementia inclusively. And here's another one of my pet peeves. You know all those assisted livings and memory care residences and nursing homes and continuous care. You know all those places being built all around your communities? Well, they kind of go like this. Castles with boats. <laughs> because they, they're built and they're really fancy, some of them, right? They're right by the highway or wherever. But whoever goes there, unless they work there, they're family members, right? They're not integrated into the community. Right? It's, it's as if they are invisible, like right? they're folks inside, right? or there's a boat around them. Right? They're not integrated. They're not included in our community. And here's another pet peeve. You're hearing a lot about my pet peeves this morning. Um, you've, you've often heard it said that 80% of people with dementia still live in the community. And what that means is they live at home, right? But where do the other 20% live? Are they on Mars? Where are they? 80% of the people with dementia live in the community. Well, that 20% who are in some form of residential care, they're still a part of our community. And they need to be included. Reliable transportation, that's a tricky one. Very important. How are you going to get to a memory cafe if you can't drive anymore? Make sure environments are easy to navigate. That helps all of us. And spread of dementia awareness to other organizations in the community. T-shirt people, here you are. Okay? See? The Purple Angel? It's a program for training businesses and organizations in the community. Who are we going to train? Oh, all these people. I saw a few people coming in. I'm not sure I see them now. They're from the Sheriff's Department. Yay. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Notice what I have first here? Okay? Law enforcement, the first responders, you need to be a part of this dementia-friendly community effort. I'm so glad you're here. Um, healthcare systems, obviously. There's a lot of emergency rooms that are definitely not dementia-friendly. Faith communities. We need to work with faith communities, local governments, restaurants, grocery stores, banks. Oh, I had a, um, I was on a committee up in Appleton with a banker. Okay, really nice guy. Um, uh, he worked for this bank for a long time. He told me about a woman who came into the bank and brought all her pills to him and spilled them out and asked for his help in sorting them. Right? Because he, she trusted him. Now, he needs to know how to work with folks who have a dementia. And there's lots of other reasons why bankers need to know that, too. Um, employers. If we're going to start emphasizing early diagnosis, some of these people getting the diagnosis are still employed. What are we going to do about that? Are we going to accommodate jobs? Are we just going to say, I'm oh, sorry? No longer can work here anymore. And oh, by the way, there goes your health insurance. And residential care organizations, they need to be involved with this. Okay, so here are my examples to finish up. I got three examples of community, hospitality, and inclusion. Do you know about Spark? Yay, I'm glad you know about Spark. Spark is cultural programming for people with memory loss. Um, it, it's in um, <coughs> museums and cultural organizations all over Wisconsin and Minnesota, too. It's fabulous. They offer um, monthly programs for um, arts engagement. They're just marvelous programs. I'll show you a couple pictures. Um, this one, I guess you can't see it too 
well, this is from up in Appleton um, at our building for kids. Um, there's also a spark program at the Madison Children's Museum. It's wonderful. Uh, but here's some people making art. Here's the picture that's on the um, website for the spark program. So I love this picture. Look at that. They're so happy. Okay. So these are marvelous community inclusion programs with creative engagement um, that really make a difference for people. Not just the folks with a dementia, but for the care partners who get to be friends with others. So that's Spark. And then there's Memory Camp. Um, there was one couple from Dodge County who came to Memory Camp uh, last summer. Uh, uh, my husband and I organized it up north. You see that beautiful lake there? Well, that's at a lake at a camp in St. Germain, Wisconsin. And we were inspired to make this camp happen because of this organization over in England called Dementia Adventure. Now, if you want to get inspired to do something in Dodge County, check this out. Look what it says. Wouldn't it be wonderful if together we could enable thousands of people living with dementia and their families to enjoy more um, the adventures out in nature? Look at this fabulous thing called the Harkin Marsh. You know, can you organize groups to take walks? I'm sure they've got accessible paths there for wheelchairs or walkers. Would you do that regularly? But, you know, there's so many people who have dementia who are nature deprived. I think they never get out in nature. But that's what we have at Memory Camp. Memory Camp, this coming summer, we got two sessions. Last summer, it was just the very first, I think, in the nation of a residential camp. You are invited. Um, families, we had people last summer, ages 5 to 95. We had one family with two grandchildren. Uh, people come with their adult children. It's marvelous. And you leave your diagnosis at the top of the hill. We don't care. So, well, nature trails, fishing, just looking at the lake. That's an example, of, that's the lodge at the camp. And that's an example of one of the uh, areas where you can stay. Uh, three bedrooms, roll-in shower, so it's completely accessible. Uh, this one's got four bedrooms. We had a family there with seven siblings, <laughs> ages 71 to 95. <laughs> three of them had dementia. Those brothers and sisters all came together and had a marvelous time. Okay. I have a question. That was last year. Yeah, oh, yeah. staffing volunteer. Staff, the camp is staffed. And it's the, the camp is Moon Beach Camp, if any of you know Moon Beach Camp. Um, it's a camp that has um, about 15 years experience running uh, camp uh, sessions for children and youth with autism and families. So they really know how to care for persons with a cognitive disability. Um, and so there's staff, but then there are volunteers also. My husband and I were the camp directors. We didn't get whistles, but <laughs> didn't, get, didn't get hats, but yeah. But anyway, and it was three nights and two full days. So talk to me if you're interested. We would love to have you. We had, we had so much fun. It was just marvelous. And then finally, I'm getting towards the end of my talk, I have to tell you just a little bit about the Fox Valley Memory Project. Um, this is our new logo, that's our website, and you can find us on Facebook. My last picture slide is going to be of our Facebook page. Um, so this will tell you about what we do up in Northeast Wisconsin. We've got these programs, we've got memory cafes, we offer eight monthly meetings, we take people on four annual bus trips. We get 55 people on a bus and we go places. Um, you'll see some pictures of our bus trips in a minute. They're, they're marvelous. It's a way not to feel excluded. You're included. Okay? Uh, we have meetups at cultural events, like we go to um, dress rehearsals for plays and concerts. Um, uh, once a month, we get, folks get together for dinner and a pizza, pizza ranch, okay? And they just gather. They know on the second Wednesday of the month they're going to go have dinner with other folks. 
who are sharing this journey of a dementia. It helps people not feel so isolated. And then we have this chorus that I told you about. <laughs> picture in a we have a resource center. We do community education. We do the Purple Angel training. Um, we've got a memory assessment center, thank goodness. Uh, we're hooked up with a, um, a medical clinic. And we do in-home care partner coaching. And then we do outreach to long-term care. We say those 20% are still a part of our community. And so we do this spring arts event where we get residents from all these different long-term cares and we come to a central gathering place and you'll see a picture in a minute of an arts event that we did. So, here's some pictures. Memory cafes. It's an hour and a half to two hours of fun, socializing, interaction with people who understand. People who understand. And you make friends. I love this picture right here. I don't know if you can see this too well. We get, uh, uh, every year we get permission from the DNR to uh, have the Memory Cafe participants go fishing with some Nina High School students. It's fabulous. This woman talked about this fish for days. <laughs> uh, uh, this man hardly ever talks but um, he and his wife were at the memory cafe where I was, where we were making these wreaths, not to, for the people to take home, but to be sold to raise money for the library where we meet. In other words, it was a service project you can do for others and have fun. And that's my husband, he plays the ukulele. <laughs> <laughs> so memory cafes. And then beyond the memory cafes, there's our course, there's our cool t-shirts. Um, uh, this was our spring arts event. Uh, we got residents of long-term care and um, children in, the, well, I guess, I don't know what you call them, junior high students, young adolescents, in some art classes. And they got, we got them together. We taught the kids about uh, the dimensions. And then we got together and we had this arts event with folks from residential care. I dropped my thing. Oh, where did it go? Right here by your gray day. Warm clothes. Okay. Oh, there I am. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you need that duct tape. Thank you very much. <laughs> or my fingers. Okay, almost done here. Um, we, have, we have these outings. That's our first outing where we got on a bus. We went up to Green Bay and then we took a boat on the Fox River and we had lunch together. Fun. Uh, this is a course. Uh, this is a gathering at uh, the restaurant I told you about, and this is um, uh, being at a dress rehearsal for a play up in the, at the UW Fox Valley. That's from our Facebook page. And speaking of Facebook, that's our Facebook page. Um, and this is a picture, this group picture is from our most recent outing, um, which was to go up to the Green Bay Packers exhibit up at the Neville Art uh, Museum up in Green Bay, and then, <coughs> then, I don't, do you get WHBY down here, the Green Bay News, maybe you get Milwaukee, I don't know what the news is. Anyway, WHBY is a Green Bay News station that people in Appleton and surrounding areas watch, and they got to see, like, the weather guy came in and talked to them, and, and the newscaster, and, and it was very exciting. It was a wonderful day. So that's our Facebook page where we post tons of uh, pictures of all the stuff we do. So like us on Facebook. Check out what we do, and thank you.